We are so glad you are here. My name is Daniel Kazanave. I'm the pastor here at the Bridge Church, and today is a special day. Uh, one is we're finishing up a series that we call the Battle Ready, and we've been studying Matthew chapter 4, the temptations of Jesus, and how he overcame those temptations, and how he also uh, kind of paved the way and modeled for us how we can overcome those temptations in our life as well. And also, today we are celebrating baptism. Uh, baptism celebration. So I'm excited for that. Hopefully you're excited for that. Uh, people are taking public declarations of faith. Uh, and so we're doing that right after service. We hope that you will plan to stay. Another quick note on baptism. If you're sitting in the room and you have been thinking over the past couple of weeks, uh, I've given my life to Christ, but I've never taken that step of baptism. I invite you today. Everything is set up. We have clothes for you. We have people ready to talk with you and pray with you right after service. So if that's you. Uh, let's uh, eliminate all those barriers and make today the day. And so you can stop by the Connect Center right after the message, right after service, and we can get you set up and squared away. Uh, but I want to pray for us, ask God to speak during this time. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 4. If you're trying to find it in your Bibles or your phones, we're going to have it on the screens for you as well. Uh, we're also going to be in Ephesians chapter 6. So those are, uh, Matthew chapter 4 is really our base verse, and then in Ephesians chapter 6. So uh, let's pray together and ask God to speak during this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. Uh, we praise you. I'm so incredibly thankful and honored that we get to do this today, that we get to gather, that we get to worship. God, I pray that you would speak during this time. I pray that your word uh, would just reveal things in our heart, God. And I pray ultimately that we walk out of this place knowing that we have victory in you. God, that you give us strength, that you give us the way uh, to overcome those temptations. And God, that we uh, don't have to allow the enemy to win in our lives, but we can win those spiritual battles that you have, uh, that are in front of us through your power, God. I pray that I will decrease so that you may increase. I pray that uh, you would speak during this time, God. We love you. We ask all this in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said. Amen. If you're joining us for the first time or jumping in, I just want you to know uh, we are Bible people. We are Jesus people. We're community people. And so we're going to dive into the scriptures. We say this a lot. The power and the authority is in the word of God and, and not with what I say. And so we like to dig through the Bible. Um, and so we're going to Matthew chapter four, like I said. Uh, but we've been in the series uh, called Battle Ready. And does anybody remember the title of the first week? The title of the first week, it starts with an A and it kind of makes you hungry. Appetite, right? Appetite. And we use that because we see the first temptation that Jesus walked through is that this need for more. The enemy comes to Jesus and says, I know you're hungry. You're physically tired, physically exhausted, but turn that stone into bread. And he tries to tempt Jesus to come off of uh, God's will in his life. And then he comes after him after that, and he gives a, a, tries to come with another temptation. So not only the need for more, but then he comes with approval, right? Approval. He's going, hey, Jesus, if you really are, right? He tries to accuse, if you really are the Son of God, then jump off this and, and uh, allow people, look, you, I can make all of this happen for you. If you jump off, prove to everybody that you are the Son of God. And Jesus was going, whoa, I, I don't need to test the Lord my God. And then the third temptation, last week we talked about ambition. The, the, I, in order to be fulfilled, I must do more. Because he brings Jesus to the top of the temple and he goes, look, I can give you all of this. You can have everything, right? And uh, we found that kind of comical here as a church because, I mean, Jesus created all things, right? And so, but the enemy is trying to tempt you and I to say, hey, you need this in order to be filled, fulfilled. And you need this in order to be approved. And we walk down this road. And today we're going to end with what I'm calling the battle plan. Uh, we really got to talk about how those temptations uh, affect us, but today we're talking about the plan. Get really practical. How, what did Jesus do in order to overcome these temptations? And I want to give you kind of a three-pronged approach that Jesus gives us here today. And we're going to start in Matthew chapter 4. And as I start there in verse 1, uh, the thing is for you and I uh, to know and understand the schemes of the enemy. Because if we know and understand the schemes of the enemy, then we can disarm 
the enemy inside of our lives. We can disarm the enemy in front of us. It reminds me uh, here recently, I realized my third son um, is a real estate tycoon. Okay, he's only six, but I, I realized this because we were playing Monopoly. Um, it was actually, I think, Catopoly. Don't judge me, but we were playing this as a family, and all of a sudden, I realized his strategy was: I'm going to buy every piece of property I come to. Right, like every like that was his strategy. I don't know how he picked it up. I didn't teach him that strategy. It's a pretty good strategy because, uh, and then as soon as he got money, he was like, oh, I'm putting a hotel on this. I'm putting a house on this. I'm putting, right? And he just started building up all of this wealth. He kept kind of reinvesting all this stuff. But anyway, I, I was just, I was, we were laughing so hard because uh, we realized that. But then when I realized his strategy, I was like, okay, now I can start blocking him, right? I can start playing against him. I didn't know, but once I knew, it was almost half the battle. I knew how to play him that way, and uh, especially in Monopoly, you know, if you see somebody going towards the railroads, what's the play? Get the other railroads, right? Try to sell them back. All the, Anyway, um, getting off track, but uh, all of this to, to say that when we know the schemes, that really helps us in our strategy. And to kind of bring it back in, obviously a lot more serious is the spiritual battles that we face because those are very real and those can affect our lives. And honestly, the enemy is not kind of walking around going, I hope, I I just want them to have a bad day and feel bad about themselves. No, the Bible says he wants to steal, kill, and destroy our lives. He wants to ruin all of those things. And so if we understand his schemes, then we can lean in and say, now I'm living from victory and not for victory. But uh, we can look in Matthew chapter 4. We're going to read verses 1 through 11. Uh, We've picked through it the past three weeks, but I just wanted to overview it, read it again, and then look at three uh, pronged approach of what Jesus uses here. Is everybody still okay? Very good. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, it says this. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted there by the devil. For 40 days and 40 nights, he fasted and became very hungry. During that time, the devil came and came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. But Jesus told him, no, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city, Jerusalem, to the highest point of the temple and said, if you are the son of God, jump off for the scriptures say Satan comes back and even starts quoting scripture back to Jesus. He will order his angels to protect you and they will hold you up with their hands so you won't even hurt your foot on a stone. Jesus responded, the scriptures also say you must not test the Lord your God. Next, the devil took him to the peak of a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said, I will give it all. To you, he said, if you kneel down and worship me, get out of here, Satan, Jesus told him, for the scriptures say you must worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil went away and the angels came and took care of Jesus. Some translations say the devil went away and the angels ministered to Jesus. What a sight to picture Jesus fasting for 40 days, 40 nights. He resists the devil and the devil flees. We even see that in the book of James. It says resist the devil and he will flee. And then the angels come around Jesus and minister and fill him and strengthen him back up just to see that the full humanity of Jesus, but yet he was still 100% God and also 100% man that, that he understands the toils and the trials that you and I go through. But the first thing that I want us to get, and this one is easy to miss because um, as I first studied this, I, I looked at this and began to study and read and all of these things, um, there was really kind of two big pieces to this. But if you don't really understand where Jesus came from and his background, the first one is really easy to miss. And the first one, if you're taking notes, I'd love for you to write this down, is to receive the armor. You and I have to receive the armor that God has laid out for us, that he's given us the armor to overcome the enemy. And one thing about Jesus is, is that Jesus grew up as a Jewish young boy. He would he went to school and his parents would have taught him a lot of the Old Testament. He would have grown up uh, 
memorizing the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. And later we see that Jesus is a rabbi. People call him teacher, rabbi. Like he went through that school and he knew scripture. He memorized scripture. He knew prayer, all of that. He knew all of that. And then when he was 30 years old, he was baptized and started his public ministry. And the first thing in his public ministry is he was led by the spirit into the wilderness where we see here in Matthew chapter 4. But he had all of that previous 30 years of receiving his armor. And I think about somebody getting ready for war and we're all ready for a battle. And as they're getting their armor ready, they just don't walk out into battle, right? And they, they don't just grab their armor and then run out into battle, right? No, they, they, they pull it out. Okay, how does this work? How, how do these little details, how does this fit on me? Does, this, does my helmet fit right? Is it tight? Is it all of these things, right? They know their armor. They know how to use it. And you and I, we have spiritual armor that God gives us. And you and I have the opportunity to receive that armor, but not only to receive it, but how does this armor Work And as we're thinking about that, we see this in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13 is all we're going to read here today. Uh, But this is the Apostle Paul, and he's trying to encourage us. He's saying, hey, there's a battle going on around you and I, a spiritual battle, and I want you to be ready for it. I want you to be armored up for this battle. And so this is what he says in Ephesians 6, verse 10. It says, a final word, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. I love how that verse starts off. And he points all the weight on Jesus, right? He points all the weight on God. I want you to be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. He doesn't say, hey, I want you, I want Daniel to be strong. I want Brad to be strong. No, he's saying, I want you to be strong in the Lord. He puts all of that weight on Jesus is going, be strong in Christ. And then he says, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will be standing firm. Amen, right? What a powerful piece of scripture for you and I to realize that God has given us this armor for you and I to wear. And some of the pieces I'm going to kind of go over, and I encourage you to go back and read all of Ephesians chapter 6, starting there in verse 10, to really dive into some of these. But for time's sake, uh, to really see that he gives us some of this armor, some of the armor that we have already been talking about all throughout this series. He says, I want you to put on the uh, helmet of salvation, right? Like my piece of mine comes from knowing who I am in Christ, that I don't have to be approved by other people in my lives. I'm approved, fully approved in Christ. That protects my mind. That protects my thought process. When the enemy tries to attack me, I'm going, hey, you you need to do this in order for them to like you. You need to do this in order for you to be a good mom. You need to do this in order for you to be a good man. You need, if you were a real man, Then you would do this, right? Like he attacks our mind. But you and I, we can go back of going, no, I know who I am in Christ. I know what Christ has done for me. I know he has set me free and I have my helmet of salvation. And also he says the breastplate of righteousness. I am made right by the power and blood of Jesus Christ, right? Like that protects my heart, my vital organs, who I am. It protects my emotions. It's like my inner soil. I know I am protected Because I am made right by the power of God. And he says the belt of truth, what holds everything together, right? We put our belt on and and that holds that belt of truth together. Then he says the shield of faith, right? It blocks the fiery arrows that the enemy throws at us. That my faith is in Jesus, not in what I do. My faith is in Jesus, not in what I need to have. My faith is in Jesus, not in the enemy. My faith is in Jesus, not in this world, right? And that is my shield. It protects the fiery arrows that are in front of us. then he says, I want you to have the sword of the spirit. And he says, that is the word of God. 
that this, I love this sword of the spirit, how he talks about the word of God, is our offensive weapon, right? He's like, this is not a defense. He's like, you are not made to stand back and just to receive this. He's like, no, move forward. You have the, the sword of the spirit. You have the word of God to move forward. And then he says on pray in every occasion, right? Like pray in the spirit, pray, like ties all of this together, communicating with God. And you know what one of my uh, favorite things about the armor of God is? is there is nothing on our back. All of our armor is in front of us because you were not made to run from the enemy. God did not create you to be scared and terrified and run from what Satan is doing inside of our lives. He is going, no, I'm putting all the armor. Everything you need is in front of you. You move forward. You resist the enemy and he will flee. I'm giving you all authority and power has been given to Jesus, right? And he's saying, now I'm commissioning you as my people. You are co-heirs in Christ. He's saying, now I want you to stand firm in the faith and move forward and do not let the enemy enemy deter you do not let him entice you and derail you but receive the armor of god and you and i have this opportunity every day to open up god's word and going "Ooh, get my armor ready right like i'm i'm checking okay how does this helmet of salvation work how does this how does the truth work in my life i got my belt of truth i got my breastplate of righteousness i am made right in christ i got the sword of the spirit how do i use this thing right like how do i use the word of god and i'm I'm getting to know my arm i'm getting battle ready through the word of God. And every day I'm preparing for that, just like Jesus did throughout his life. And I am a huge uh, proponent of memorizing scripture. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit at the end of the message, but just knowing scripture, because now I'm, I'm a walking Bible, right? Like I can, uh, I, the enemy may tempt me and all of a sudden, boom, sort of the spirit right there. I can resist the enemy with a piece of scripture or something that's already in me and in my heart. And so that's the first one is the, that we see this and how incredible is it? And that's why I believe church is important. That's why I believe discipleship, small groups and bridge kids are, are, are so important because we are helping shape the minds of kids of going, this is your armor, right? Like this is what you need. This is to resist the enemy. When you go to school and somebody whispers this in your ear, or you hear this in their thought in your mind of going, hey, you know, that's not who you are. This, this is who Christ has made you to be. And raising up the foundation in that is so incredibly important. And then the second one is, is uh, the first one is to receive the armor. And the second thing that we see Jesus do is that he recognizes that the enemy is trying to attack him. So you and I, we can recognize the temptation. And really, honestly, this whole, the first three weeks, that's what we were doing. We were trying to recognize, okay, this is a temptation. This is the voice of the enemy, and this is the voice of God. And we talked about all of these different things. The first week, we talked about appetite, the need for more, right? And he uses fear to try to uh, make us want more. Hey, you need that, or your kids aren't going to have this, right? Like this fear, hey, if you don't get this, then you're not like, you're not going to actually be a man. You're not going to receive this, right? Uses fear to hold on to that. And he tries to push us to either gutters. And then we even see an approval. He uses shame of going, hey, you're messed up. You can't get right. Nobody can fix you, right? Like the shame, the weight, the heaviness. But we know that in Christ, I am made complete. In Christ, I know who I am in him. And then we can recognize those, tem- those temptations. And we even see this throughout scripture. We see the rich young ruler, right? He comes up and Jesus says, hey, I want you to, uh, to come. He was rich and he was young. I mean, he's successful early in life. He had a lot of possessions. And Jesus says, I see that your possessions kind of have a hold on you. And I want to release you from that. So uh, I want you to leave those go sell all you have to the poor and come follow me and the rich young ruler says that he walks away sad was he because he can't release what he has on this earth to follow jesus because the enemy will put that temptation in our heart you need more you can't let that go right the fear you can't let that go you will not make it if you do not have all of that, right? All of that, just recognizing the temptations. And we see Peter all throughout the Bible. I, I believe Peter uh, really fought the temptation of ambition, of wanting to do more. And in fact, whenever he got discouraged, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this next week. But uh, when Peter got discouraged, what did he do? He went right back to fishing. 
He kind of got frazzled, right? Like Jesus is gone and, oh, okay, I'm going back fishing. I'm going to go back, do what I know, right? Start going back. to. I just need to produce more. If I throw myself into my business, then I'll maybe forget uh, the state that I'm in, right? And it, just recognizing the temptation is huge for you and I. Because once we recognize, okay, this is from the enemy. Now I know how to attack. Now I know how to go back. And Jesus, we even see the temptation come all the time where Jesus is in ministry. And he's teaching. All of a sudden, these huge crowds would come and try to follow Jesus. And what does Jesus usually do? He thins the crowd. He usually will say something crazy like, those who only eat my flesh and drink my blood can follow me. And everybody, and everybody's like, Jesus, come on, man. Like, we just started having two services. And then all now you're saying this and people are scattering. Like, come on, Jesus, right? Because Jesus wasn't battling approval. He didn't need this huge crowd. He said, I'm going to tell the truth because the truth will set you free. And and then I'm going to leave that on the feet of people. I'm trying to show them that I am the way. I am the truth. And I don't need the approval of man. I'm serving God, right? And Jesus shows this as he even battles that together in his lives. And we see this all throughout Scripture and all throughout even the disciples' lives. But if we can recognize the temptation, we understand, okay, this is, is not from God. This is maybe shame or this is guilt. I realize this, right? I I have my armor. And then the last piece that uh, the enemy does is that a lot of times with the temptation, because the temptation is a lie. The temptation is a lie. Him trying to derail. And remember our definition of a temptation is an enticement against the will of God to pull us against what God's plan is for our life. And so he begins to lie to us, to feed us some of those lies. And you and I, we have an opportunity. Do I believe the lie or do I believe the truth? Where am I going to place my faith? And the funny thing about a lie is if we live, you and I, if we receive a lie, Even if we know it's a lie, but if we live as though we believe the lie is truth, then it acts like truth in our life, right? Like it begins to shape who we are. It begins to shape our actions and all of these things in our lives. Even though it's not true, it can still affect our lives, right? Even, I mean, just think about it. Maybe when you were a kid, somebody said something to you that was not true, that was a lie. And even as an adult, you hear that voice in the back of your head. Oh, you're you're never going to make money. Oh, you're never going to be a CEO. Oh, you're just not leadership material. Oh, you're just, I don't know if you really can even love people. Like you just, you're emotionally detained. Maybe somebody whispered some of those lies into our hearts, but if we believe those lies, then we carry those and we act as if those lies are true. And Jesus is saying, I, I don't want you to live by those lies. I want you to live by the truth of God. And so you and I, not only do we have to recognize, right? That's half the battle to recognize that it's a temptation. But we now we have to recognize that lie. And we remove that lie, move away from that lie. But we have to replace that lie with the truth. You and I, we have to not only remove that void, but then we got to replace that void with the truth. And if you look at if somebody has maybe struggled with um, or just a battle with some kind of addiction in their lives, a lot of times uh, we see that the things that really help them is they remove that powerful addiction, but then they'll replace something that's healthy in their lives or replace some of those habits with some healthy things so that, that not just removing the thing is not, the, that's about half the battle, right? Now we got to replace it with what is good. We got to replace it with what is healthy. And so you and I, when we receive the lie, not only do we need to recognize it and move away from from it, but we need to replace it with the truth that God has given us. And that's the opportunity that you and I have is, is living in the truth of God, living in the word of God and going, this is who God has called me to be, that I focus in on some of that. And so I just want to get ready to uh, land the plane here, but I want to give us some incredibly practical verses. So if you're taking notes, I love to give you some of these for each temptation that we get. That, that this is, hey, if you receive you recognize this is a temptation 
Here's the word of God for it, right? Here's the lie. Here's the truth that I can replace it. And that way we walk out of this place with some armor, with some tools of going, this is a verse that I need to memorize. This is a verse I need to have on hand. I told you guys approval is when the enemy comes at me at a lot. And so I, the approval ones, I, I, they're right here in my mind of re- replacing that lie with the truth. This is who I am in Christ. And so the first one is we talk about I need more, right? And the, how the enemy tries to pull us in of going, this, you need this. Or he will pull us that way or he'll pull us on the other side of the gutter where we try to hoard things, right? I, I got to hold on to my stuff. It's mine. I worked hard for it. Like I, I need this. If I don't have it, I'm fearful of it, right? And Jesus is saying, no, I want you to be free from that. I want you to be free from that bondage of thinking you need that. And so uh, Philippians chapter 3 verses 4 through 8 is a powerful verse for that because it talks about uh, the uh, correlation between Christ and the things of this world. And Paul uses this strong language of that he's saying compared to Christ, this is garbage. Like he uses that strong language going, the, the things I'm trying to hold on to compared to the beauty and majesty and the power of Christ. And then we even see Matthew chapter 6, verses 32 through 33. And the, the incredible kind of well-known, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. And then he uh, begins to show that to us. Those are two verses really to kind of get us started. And then uh, if we talk about ambition, where I... I need more. I got to continue to move forward. The guilt, hey, you need to do this. You can't miss out on it. You and I, we can look at Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. And it says, if I will boast in anything, I will boast in the cross. If I boast in it, if my heart is set on anything, it's going to be set on the cross of Jesus. Or Ephesians chapter 2. And I'm telling you, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, we can solve a lot of problems in life if we have to read those verses. But Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10, it talks about we are saved by grace and not by what? Works, right? Not by works. And then he says, you are God's handiwork you are god's masterpiece created anew in christ jesus and now we live out of that of going he prepared think about this he prepared good works for you long ago before you were born he looked at your life and was like okay she's going to be born in this family in this time in this generation, right? Like in, in this moment in history, and I have prepared good works for you right here in this moment. And then uh, the, the last one we talked about is approval. I need the respect of people. Like I need their approval and the shame of, of the two gutters that go either side, right? Where uh, I need the approval of people or I detach and I'm like, I don't even care about people, right? Like I don't care what people think. I'm going to go to this side if I have to and, and try to fill that void. But you and I, we go back to the verse that we talked about, which is, um, Ephesians 2, 1 through 10 is a powerful uh, collection of verses. It talks about that we were dead in our sin, now made new in Christ. And then in Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, that I don't live for the approval of man, but the approval of God and how he works inside of our lives and then inside of our hearts. And I just want to uh, get ready to close here today because we're going to make a little bit of time for baptism here at the end of service. And my cry, my heart for you and I, is that we live battle ready. That Christ created you to live the abundant life found in Christ. John, abundant life found in Christ. John 10, 10 says that the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but Jesus has come to give life and to give it more abundantly, to give a fulfilling life. And you hear maybe uh, people who preach or you hear some things on social media, Christ has come to set us free. This is the freedom that he is talking about. Because for me, one of the burdens that I have uh, for our generation is to really understand the temptations that the enemy comes at us and we can stand firm in it. We can hold the line in it. I don't believe God's called us as Christians to turn and run from the things that are in this world that are holding us back or moving us away from God, but we turn and we face it head on. We go, I don't need your approval. I serve God. 
This is his truth. This is his word. No matter how far we stray from it, we can stand firm in the schemes of the enemy and say, this is what his word says. And I'm here to say, we need you in the fight. The enemy has derailed too many Christians for far too long. And it, whatever the temptation may be, you're not good enough to do it. You can't say that. They're going to think you're crazy. You can't do that. They'll fire you. Like, right, like all these things, like this fear. Hey, you can't do that. You're not good enough to even speak the truth of God. Do you know what you thought about life, right? Like the enemy just comes all of these things. I don't know. You need this. You need that. If you don't have that, you're not going to have a, a life that you always wanted. You're not going to have, right? Like all of these things, we recognize it. We go, no, no, this is what the word of God says. This is the truth that God has called us to. And the, the realization that you and I have the power to overcome. If we walk away from this place today knowing anything, it is that truth. That in Christ, you and I have the power to overcome. And we started each week with this verse. And I want to close with this verse. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. It says, the temptations in your life are no different from what others experience. And God is what? Faithful, right? And God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. He, when you are tempted, he will. This is a promise, right? He doesn't kind of tarry here for a moment. He will show you a way out so that you can endure. I just, my heart is, is, is longing for you and I. I need you. You need me. We're in this thing together, right? Like God's called us to be the body of Christ. Everybody has a gift. Everybody has a calling. They're not all the same. And we don't all fall into the same line, but we all have a voice. And you and I can stand firm. We can hold the line in that. And when we get tired, we come together, right? Like I want us as the bridge church to be this beacon of light that God has called us to. To. And the voices in this church with each other are louder than the voices of the enemy, right? Like we come together going, look, I, this temptation, that's not true. This is what the word of God says. We're, my shield is bigger. If you remember from about a month ago, my shield is bigger when I'm living in community because the, my faith shield, other people can speak into my life. We can walk through this life together and God has called us to it. And we need you in the game. And when I say the game, I'm not specifically, I mean, yeah, the bridge church, but I'm talking about in the grand scheme of eternity. That each and every one of us has the calling to love God and to love our neighbor. God, we need us in the game. The world is not getting brighter. It is getting darker. But there's an opportunity. The darker the space, the lighter the light shines. We have an incredible opportunity to stand up for the word of God because it is good news. We just spent four weeks talking about the good news and the freedom that we have in Christ and the oppression that the enemy brings, the oppression that the, the temptations bring in our life. And we were not created to live that way. We were created to live free in Jesus, free in Christ, overcome the temptations that were in front of us. And God has given us the power and the ability to do that. So I just want to pray for us here this morning. And, and my hope, my prayer is that we will take this battle plan. We will take this, um, this truth to say, you know what? I'm going to receive the armor. I'm going to get to know my armor. And then I'm going to be able to, now I can recognize the temptation, right? Like knowing's half the battle. I recognize it. That's the lie. That's from the enemy. And now I'm going to replace the lie with the truth because Jesus doesn't argue with the devil, does he? He goes, nope, this is what scripture says. Oh, yeah, yeah. You, tell, you tell me that scripture out of context? No, scripture also says this, right? Like he doesn't argue. He doesn't retreat. He stands firm. And he says, this is the word of God. This is the power and authority that we have in Christ and through his word. And so my encouragement is if there, if you still maybe feel some of those temptations, my prayer is that today, maybe uh, we, we pray together. Maybe you want to receive prayer. I'd love to pray with you. We have some leaders that would love to pray over you as well. Or maybe you want to reach out and say, hey, I, um, this temptation is for me. Uh, do you have even more verses? I'd love to know more on this particular one or these two. And uh, there's, there's no shame, right, in knowing which I just told you mine's approval, right? Like it doesn't like there's no shame in that. That's why we live in 
in community and, and dive into some of those. Or it could be, hey, this season, um, ambitions really, like I just feel like the guilt is weighing so heavy and birdie. Can I need more verses on that? We, you know, or whatever it may be, replace the lie with the truth. But let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your power, God. Thank you for what you give us in Christ. God, I pray for each and every soul that can hear my voice online or in this room. I pray that we can live from victory, God. We know that you have set us free through the power of the cross. God, I pray that we will place our faith in that and live every single day in the hope that you have given us. God, I pray that we can live battle ready. We can uh, walk in that promises, walk in those truth, and we stand firm in the word of God. God, I pray over each and every family that's in this room that we uh, work together to receive the armor and prepare for the battles that we face each and every day in our schools and in work and uh, in our neighborhoods, all of these different areas, God, that we can uh, walk in your truth, walk in your hope. Your word says that we live with the fruit of the spirit, which is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. God, I pray those fruits would be manifested in our lives. Those fruits would begin to speak loud, God. That we would love people, not so that we can gain approval, not with an agenda, God, but we can love people from a place of being whole in you. God, that we can direct them and point them to the truth that the gospel is good news. Thank you for your word, God. Thank you for your truth. We ask all this in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Would you please... Thank you for tuning in to the Bridge Church Podcast. If you would like to find out more information about our church, you can simply visit our website at thebridgebluffton.com. Have a blessed day.